My name is Shannon Carmody. I'm the Public Programs Manager here at Seed Savers Exchange and I will be telling you kind of all of the things that you need to know in order to um, get your garden set up for seed saving. And so as we go through this, we're kind of going to talk about it um, with eight different things to keep in mind and depending on your scale and what you're trying to, seed, um, to save seed from, this will be applicable to anybody's garden and you can scale it up as large as you need to or um, it can be as much for home gardeners um, as it can be for farmers. So um, if, as you have questions, um, go ahead and chat them in and uh, we'll try and answer them as we go and then we'll definitely do a, a question and answer period at the end. And um, I noticed everybody else was commenting on the weather and it is very cold here in Iowa. I think there's like a negative wind chill and so um, dreaming of our gardens is definitely the right thing to be doing this evening. Just a little background on Seed Savers before we get started. Um, we want to thank you for coming in and supporting us by attending this webinar and helping to share the knowledge that um, has been passed on for so many generations about saving seed, sharing um, stories, and, and sharing the germplasm that um, we have all depended on for our food system. And because most of you are already here, I don't have to tell you why you should save seed, but I will elaborate on a couple of the reasons. Um, you can return to more traditional farming practices. This is how people have saved and shared seeds for generations and thousands of years before us. So it's a really great way to get in touch with your garden and in some ways um, your, your roots. Um, you can save a whole lot of money. When you start saving tomato seeds, um, then you're going to have more tomato seeds than you know what to do with the following year. And this is really great if you're trying to save, save money, but it's also a really great way to be able to buy some seed one year and, and add to your collection as you go in a reasonable way. Um, and you get to also maintain your own collection of unique vegetable varieties. Seed saving is becoming more popular again, and chances are you might be able to find varieties that are unique to your region. You can find varieties that maybe farmers have been working with recently and might be adapted to your uh, growing conditions and your climate. And maybe you get your hands on something that, that you can't get from a seed catalog. By learning how to save seeds, you can kind of create and cultivate your own collection that works really well in your garden um, and gives you reliable, delicious produce every year. And of course, by doing this, you're helping to maintain genetic diversity in our food system. So as a seed saver, you're mostly concerned with maintaining varietal purity. And the, the eight tips I'm going to talk about are, most of them are kind of surrounding how do you keep a plant the same from year to year, um, and, or improve a plant from year to year. What can you do um, to make sure that you're going to have a reliable crop? Um, and what we'll have to do to break this down into into three categories is we'll talk about what you need to know about the plants, what you need to know about your growing environment and maybe your neighbor's growing environment, and then finally maybe a little bit about what pollinators are are at force in your garden. Are they bees? Is it wind? Um, that sort of a thing. So the first thing you need to know is pretty simple. You need to know what the parent plant is. Is it a hybrid or is it an open pollinated variety? Now certainly you can save seed from both um, hybrids and open pollinated varieties, but the difference is with open pollinated varieties, you're going to get something that breeds true the following year. Hybrids are created from crossing two different parents, and that first generation after the hybrid is crossed is what you're buying when you buy hybrid seed. If you save that seed and you grow it another generation, it's going to be some mixture of the parents that was created the generation before. In other words, it's not stabilized. And if you're up for a breeding project, this, is, this can be a fun thing to do, but maybe not for beginners. Um, but open pollinated varieties are going to breed true from, um, from seed year after year after year. And an heirloom is simply an open pollinated variety with a history of being preserved in a family. Um, and so here at Seed Savers, we've been trying to talk more specifically about different kinds of open pollinated varieties. Because all um, heirlooms are open pollinated varieties, but not all open pollinated varieties are heirlooms, if that makes sense. Um, some varieties are historical varieties. Maybe they were listed um, historically in a 1920 seed catalog, but they've since been dropped. Um, we would classify that more as a historical variety. Um, and there's also many uh, modern open pollinated varieties, and 
Maybe one of the most famous examples of this is the green zebra tomato, which was bred by Tom Wagner and was very recently um, was very recently bred in, in the in the history of our seeds anyway. And it's often considered kind of the poster child of heirloom varieties, even though it's not a true heirloom. Um, Grandpa Ott's Morning Glory and the German Pink Tomato would be examples of heirloom um, varieties. And then the Sun Gold Tomato, which is a favorite tomato of many gardeners, would be considered a hybrid. The next thing you should know is your plant's genus and species. Um, and so this is as simple as flipping over the back of your seed packet and looking at what, what the species is um, on the back. So certainly maybe from an eighth grade biology class you remember the domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Fortunately for seed savers, um, you really only need to, need to know family, genus, and species, and most specifically species. So the reason it's important to know um, the species is because anything in the same species will cross or can cross-pollinate with each other. Meaning, if you have um, a green <laughs> zucchini and a yellow zucchini, if those cross, you might end up with um, a mixture of those um, in the future. And th that is because they are all in the Cucurbita pipo species and they will all cross together. There are a couple of reasons why that it's important. Um, common names can be misleading. Uh, for example, in this picture, I don't know if anybody recognizes um, the, the long yellow um, fruit. That is called an Armenian cucumber. And although it's called a cucumber and we list it in the cucumber section of our catalog, it's actually a melon in the species. Um, and if you look at it, you can see the seeds look a little different than the cucumber. But um, if you're just going by common name, you, you might accidentally grow a melon and an Armenian cucumber. and um, have a crossing that you weren't prepared for. Um, this is kind of the good example. A crop type can include several different species. Um, and so what squash is a great example of this. There are actually four different species of squash commonly grown in North America um, that you, you might end up with in your garden. So you could grow four different kinds of squash and not have to worry about them cross-pollinating. Um, the four species are uh, Moschata, the Cucurbita maxima, the Argyrosperma, and, and the Peepo that we saw the picture of earlier. So by looking on the back of your seed packet, you might realize, hey, I get to grow four different squash and not have to worry about hand pollination or um, them crossing in my garden. Unfortunately, the, the inverse is also true. A species can include several crop types. Um, and as you'll see throughout this presentation, the brassica seems to be the exception to every rule. Um, so Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, collards, kohlrabi, um, and broccoli, um, they are all the exact same genus and species, meaning that they will all cross with each other. Um, and I often, I, I've often thought that maybe if I could cross my Brussels sprouts with kale and have Brussels sprouts with kale leaves, that would be a really great variety. Um, but unless you're trying to work on a breeding project, you're just going to uh, end up with some crossed seed, which isn't necessarily what you're looking for. Um, and the fourth reason that it's important to know your genus and species is because vegetables may have weedy relatives. Um, in this photo, you probably recognize it as Queen Anne's lace, which is the exact same species as carrots. And um, that pollen will readily cross with carrots that have gone to seed in your garden. And you'll be able to um, tell when you pull out your seed the following year that you've saved seed from, you're going to have um, may maybe your the roots, the carrot root will be white um, and it'll be so tough and chewy a horse wouldn't even eat it. Um, and that's because it's crossed up with this wild, weedy um, Queen Anne's lace. So um, knowing what grows in your ditches is important. Um, another example, at least here in Iowa, um, chicory often grows in ditches, especially in late summer. It's a little blue flower. If you had chicory that you were saving seed from, it could cross. Um, another example would be parsnips. There's cow parsnip and wild parsnip, um, and that could cross with uh, some of the uh, edible parsnips that you'd have in your garden. All right, the next thing to know, the third thing, is know how your plants pollinate. Because if you know how your plants pollinate, you'll know um, how to prevent them from cross-pollinating. And so this picture, again, is probably another picture you haven't seen since a high school 
uh, biology class. But when I talk about pollinating, I'm talking about how the pollen gets from the anther or the filament to the stigma or to the female part of the flower. And as we'll go through, plants have a number of ways of doing this um, and a number of ways that are more conducive to cross-pollination or less conducive. The first group we'll talk about are less conducive for uh, self-pollination or for cross-pollination. In fact, they self-pollinate mostly. Um, and these are really really great plants to work with if you're a beginner seed saver. Um, they make it really easy on you um, because they self-pollinate and you don't have to worry too much about crossing. This picture here is a picture of a cowpea and we'll talk about how that flower structure actually really helps you from uh, preventing cross-pollination. Selfers are plants that are capable of, of fertilization through self-pollination and they have a perfect flower, meaning they have both the male and the female parts in the same flower. Um, so that previous flower I showed um, and then everything else in the Fabaceae family or the legumes, peas, beans, the cow pea in the previous picture, um, all have this butterfly-like um, flower structure. You can see there's the labeled parts there. But what I want to draw your attention to is the wing petal and the keel. So on this photo on the right, we pulled off the wing petal and we pulled down the keel. And you can see when we did that, we exposed all the anthers and the female part of the flower. So what it's doing is it's covering up all of the, the parts so that it, it is likely to self-pollinate. It's going to be really hard for a bee to get in there um, and move pollen around, for example. So that is why um, beans and the Fabaceae family are really good ones for beginners. They're most likely to self-pollinate. Um, and another thing that's fun to do is go out near your garden and pull down the keel um, and just kind of pull your flowers apart and see where all of these parts are that we talked about because very few flowers um, look like that labeled diagram that I first showed you. Another example of a selfer um, and a good one for beginners is our tomatoes and those in the Sol Solanaceae family. And the photo on the left shows, oh, excuse me, you can see the petals and you can see the anthers, again, that are actually fused around the female part of the flower, or the stigma. And so often um, the, the stigma and the anther are, because the anthers are fused around it, the, they will self-pollinate before the, um, the stigma ever um, emerges. On the photo on the right, we pulled back one of the anthers and you can see the stigma that's underneath in there. Again, that's a really um, good way to prevent cross-pollination. Um, I noticed that there was a question that I thought from, from Julie that says, I thought tomatoes would cross-pollinate between species. And we'll get to, um, just because something can self-pollinate doesn't mean that it won't cross-pollinate, if that makes sense. I'm showing you that these flowers have devices that make them mostly self-pollinate, but there's always the potential for things to cross-pollinate. It's a big warning sign. Um, this photo, for example, shows two tomato flowers, um, and you can see the exerted stigma on the left. Some tomatoes actually have varieties with an exerted stigma, and if you go out in your garden and you look at the flowers and you see a variety that has an exerted stigma, you're going to know that, okay, maybe this one's more likely to self-pollinate because it's exposed. Um, so that's, you know, there's exceptions to every rule and this is no different. And again, here's that warning. Self-pollinating does not imply an inability to be cross-pollinated. Uh, pepper flowers are, have a more open flower structure and they can self-pollinate, but they frequently do cross-pollinate. And this is kind of the proof in the pudding picture here of a bee um, working in that flower. Um, I would say eggplants have a are kind are pretty open as well, so they they have a higher rate of cross pollination. But again, um, and as we go through this, it's it's part of being observant in your garden and being able to tell, um, you know, do I have a lot of pollinators? Are my my different varieties in the same species planted very close together? Um, and we'll kind of go through those as we keep going. Um, there was another question about potatoes, and potatoes are usually propagated by the tuber. Um, so you don't have to worry about those, even though they are in the sol Solanaceae. If you wanted to do potatoes from true seed as opposed to from tuber seed, that's a whole different um, 
uh, can of cookies and maybe we'll we'll talk about that one um, in a different webinar. Um, outcrosses are plants that are most often fertilized through cross-pollination and there are different reasons like I said with the pepper um, maybe that one is just more exposed and that's why it crosses. Um, but the outcrossers I'm going to talk about now, by the way that their biology is, they are more likely to cross-pollinate. Um, the first example is that I'll use our squash or anything in the cucurbit family. That would include your watermelons, cucumbers, things like that. And that is because um, they're not complete flowers. They have a male flower and a female flower. Um, and so they have to get the pollen from the male flower to the female flower female flower. And uh, squash are actually monaceous, meaning they have one plant that has both female and male flowers. So here's a picture of a female flower. You can see the ovary or the immature fruit at the base of the flower. The male flowers won't have that, so it's really easy to tell which ones are females and which ones are males. Here's another male, or female, excuse me. And these are the male flowers. You can see at the base there's the ovary's not there, there's no fruit that's ever going to form. Um, also, male flowers, there might be more of them on your plant. There's usually a higher ratio of male flowers, and they also emerge a little earlier as well. This is a picture of a of watermelon from the top down. The flower on the left is a male flower, the flower on the right is a female. It's really hard to tell from this way. Um, you can tell that the flower on the left um, is a little more yellow um, and that's because that's it has the pollen on it and the pollen's trying to get to the female flower but it's pretty tricky to tell just by looking at the flower it's really best to look at the base um, and look for that fruit. Um, corn is an example of another diaceous or excuse me a monaceous plant meaning there are two flowers a male flower and a female flower on the same plant. Um, the tassels are the male flower and the silks are the female flowers down below. And then finally there are dioecious outcrossers which mean um, that there are two separate plants, a male plant and a female plant. And spinach is an example of a dioecious outcrosser. You can see the female plant, you can see where the seeds are immature and green there and the male plant um, kind of in the foreground that will have a lot of pollen. If you were to shake that plant, you'd be able to see the pollen kind of blow off in the air um, because that's how it would uh, want to pollinate the female. And then there are the exceptions to the rule, the brassica family. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they kind of make life hard for us here at the farm. Uh, Brassica family, they, they have a self-incompatibility gene. Basically, they recognize their own DNA and they reject it because they want to keep a lot of diversity within their, their plant type. And that's why you can have all of these different um, cabbages and broccolis and cauliflowers in the same um, species because it's such a diverse species. So um, with these varieties, we'll talk about how you have to kind of work around the fact that you might need to be working with more than one plant. All right, so if you're, if you're working in, in your garden and you're trying to maintain this varietal purity that we talked about at the beginning of the workshop, you need to know how to prevent cross-pollination by using isolation methods. Um, or you can take the easy route and only plant one variety per species in your garden. Then you don't really have to worry at all about things crossing. But say you're, you're like me and you need absolutely need four varieties of uh, tomatoes in your garden, what are some ways to work around that? And we'll talk about a few of those. Um, a few isolation methods. Again, I'm going to re reiterate, if you're a beginner, the easiest way is simply to grow one variety per species. Um, and the other thing you can do is isolation by distance. There are a number of resources online that have charts that say, plant your tomatoes 10 feet apart from each other. And I'll give you um, an idea of where you can find some of those resources. Um, the, the, the problem is, depending on where you live and how many pollinators you have and, and what your garden's like, the isolation distance really varies. Um, for example, where I live, uh, I have no pollinators in my garden. I don't know where they go. Um, 
but they're they're not in my garden, and I have to hand pollinate my squash just in order to get a, a crop for eating, not even just for seed. So I don't necessarily have to worry about isolation by distance quite as much as someone who has lots of pollinators in their garden, if that makes sense. So um, I'll refer you to some areas where you can look up isolation distances, but a lot of times it's just separating um, self-pollinating varieties like tomatoes or beans by the distance of your garden, or making sure that there's some plant in between um, that kind of acts as a little bit of a barrier. Um, so like I said, I, I will refer you to distances, but take it with a grain of salt based on your own observations of your garden. Um, the other thing you can do is geographical isolation. I showed you this photo here because this is a picture at Heritage Farm, um, and maybe the first thing of, you might notice in the picture is that there's just one variety per species growing in this garden. The other thing you might notice um, is the, the kind of the bluff and the forest in the background, and that acts as um, a barrier by um, geographical distance as well as um, a barrier where where bees and other pollinators aren't going to make it across there to the garden that's on the other side. We've got these really lovely bluffs out here and it, they actually are really important in the way that we lay out our farm and the way that we isolate gardens. You can also do isolation by timing. Um, for example, if you have a neighbor who grows a corn crop and you want to grow a different kind of corn and save the seed from it, if you know when they plant theirs and you know the timing of their, their flowering and, and the pollen shedding, you can um, time your corn to be two weeks earlier or two weeks later or something like that um, in order to make sure that they're not pollinating at the same time. You can even look for older varieties of corn that maybe have a, a later pollination um, or pollen shedding period. Um, than, than some of the varieties that are growing. But you can get really creative by timing. And also by timing, that, that could mean maybe you only grow one tomato for seed every year, but you rotate what that variety is, um, and you can replenish your seed stocks every three or four years. Um, so if you have one area of your garden where you can um, grow seed, and, and kind of keep everything else to the other side of the garden, maybe you can isolate by timing um, in a more seasonal sense than just um, a couple weeks here or there, like, a, like in the corn example. Another method, one that we use heavily here at the farm, is isolation by barrier with tents. Um, in this photo, you can see in the foreground there are the smaller tents, and inside are pepper plants. And as I mentioned, with pepper plants, they are self-pollinating, but they will, and they frequently do, cross-pollinate. So if we put these tents over them, we're going to keep out pollinators that would cross. Um, if you had two varieties in your garden, you'd only actually need to cover one because you don't have that potential to cross. Um, in the background of the picture, I don't know if you can see, there are some bigger tents. They're quite a bit larger than the pepper plants and those will actually grow watermelon inside of and will actually put bees inside to do the pollination for us. That is definitely not on the scale of most home gardeners, but there are a lot of home gardeners who um, can make simple tents to cover um, their peppers or things like that uh, when they're flowering. Um, and there's a question about what kind of material are the isolation tents. Um, and that's a good question. In the, in the foreground, you can see the brown, brownish or the tan colored ones. Those are from a material um, supplier that we get in Florida that professionally makes these tents. But in the back, you can see there are some white tents, and that, that's just made of reme. Um, as Becky mentions, um, row cover could potentially do the same thing, as long as you make sure there's no holes in it and, and you're really covering the plants well. Another isolation method that you can do um, is hand pollination. And in this photo right here, um, John from our farm is hand pollinating a squash plant. He has a male in his right, a male flower in his right hand, and he's brushing the pollen onto the female flower. Um, this is a really good trick, again, like I mentioned earlier, if you don't have a lot of pollinators and you need to pollinate anyway. Um, but it's also not nearly as hard as it sounds because you only have to do this to the squash that you want to save seed, or to the fruit that you're going to save seed from. 
Um, so what this means is you don't need to do your whole crop hand pollinated, just the ones that you want to save seed from, and then you can mark them so that you know what's what. Um, and we do have a, another webinar that goes into great detail about hand pollination and it's in the archive so you can check that one out. Um, and you definitely don't have to worry about that um, in February, you can, you can wait till uh, July or August until, until you have to start doing that one. Hand pollination for corn is another reality that we have here at the farm. Um, I always think if, if anyone thinks they can grow corn somewhere in Iowa without it cross-pollinating, they're probably wrong um, because corn pollen can travel f very far in the wind um, and we hand pollinate all of our corn at the farm. Okay, so that's, um, that's a really quick overview of how to have different isolation methods. And again, if this is intimidating to you, just grow one variety per species. Um, or if, if this is intimidating, grow a variety that's more likely to self-pollinate and doesn't need a huge isolation distance. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is knowing a plant's population needs. Um, when you save seed, um, you want to know that you're saving seed that represents the whole population from what you planted. Um, you don't want inbreeding depression to happen with your plants. So for example, if you have um, this I believe is a rutabaga here, if, if you were to save seed from just one rutabaga, you would be selecting and narrowing down the population genetics drastically when you select that. So you want to save seed from a number of plants um, and from a number of different fruits, um, you know, if you're working with something like tomatoes or squash, so that you're fully representing your population. And the, there's, there's also, um, and some of the reference, or the resources I'll refer you to at the end of the um, presentation have charts again that say you need, you know, five tomato plants for your population size. I'll, I'll give you some information on that, but generally another good way to think about it is um, the more inbreeding it is, the, the more self-pollinating it is, the smaller the population size needs to be because it's, it's used to self-pollinating. It often, um, it's very inbreeding. And the more outbreeding it is, the more likely it needs to be cross-pollinating, like those brassicas that I talked about earlier with their self-incompatibility gene, the larger the population size needs to be. So generally, that's a good rule of thumb. And again, I'll refer you to, refer you to a chart at the end um, that can give you the details that you need. Population size, I think, is a really intimidating to beginners. Um, so a lot of times it's just assessing your own needs. If you start saving seed for three years and then you notice maybe your population or your plants aren't doing as well, um, maybe you can contact another source that has the seed and introduce some, some, more, um, some more diversity into your population and save from a larger population again. You're not going to see this um, right away. It might take a couple years before you would notice that your population's um, becoming too inbred. Um, the sixth thing is to know your pollinators. Um, and again, this is just a lot of being a seed saver is being really observant in your environment and knowing if you have a lot of pollinators, knowing if, you know, if you're growing corn or spinach, um, do you live in a windy area and is that pollen moving? So just absorb, absorb um, and observe what your situation is and, um, and know that that might affect what you have to do for isolation distances. All right, the seventh thing is to know your environment. Um, and this, this has a, a number of different implications. Um, knowing, first of all, that you have pollinators might make you wonder, okay, where are their pollen sources? What are my neighbors growing? Is it possible that just over the fence you have a neighbor growing, um, you know, a brassica that's gonna mix with your brassica? So um, this can be a really big challenge with, uh, with community gardens, for example. Um, so just keeping tabs on what's, what's growing around you and, and how far pollen can travel um, is a good thing to keep, keep your eye on. The other thing about your growing environment is to know the timing and the spacing. So, um, for example, with timing, um, for those of us who are used to planting lettuce in the spring, you harvest its leaves um, and then you pull out the plant once it starts um, getting too bitter or it starts bolting. 
If you're saving seed, you're going to have to leave that lettuce plant in there a lot longer and it's going to flower, it's going to take up more space. Um, so you just have to prepare for that timing. Um, and also, you know, the space is going to, it's going to need a little bit more space. Another example of timing being drastically different is the fact that many, many plants that we grow in the garden as annuals are actually biennials to create, to finish their life cycle. Um, examples of that are carrots, um, all of the brassicas, um, mo many things with roots like your, you know, your beets and that sort of thing will, will not go to seed until the fo um, following year. Um, so this photo here in the background is a picture of brassicas that have been um, stored over winter and are, are about to get planted out in the spring. And so that, um, that is a very challenging plant for a beginner to save seed from, but just a, a, a whole lot more time than it would be if you were growing it for, um, say, a head of broccoli. Um, so this plays into know when to harvest. When you, when you start thinking about what your plant's going to look like when it's um, fully mature, it's going to look a lot different than, than it might when you harvest it for market maturity. For example, um, eggplants, which look really beautiful, they're purple, they're shiny, they're, they look like you could just fry them up in a pan and eat them, you're going to want to leave them on the, the plant until they're brown and they're large and the seeds are fully developed um, and, and taking up quite a bit of space on the inside. So unfortunately, with a lot of seed saving, um, you're gonna, you don't get to save your seed and eat it too. Um, tomatoes are an exception. You can eat your tomatoes and often squash you can as well. Um, but you have to be aware of what you're looking for in your plant by the time it um, is mature. And this gets back to that biannuals versus annuals. So an annual needs just one growing season to produce seed and complete its life cycle. These are your corns, your beans, your squash, tomatoes, um, and all of those beginner ones we talked about are really good examples. Um, and then the biennial crops require two growing seasons to produce seed, and that's because they need a vernalization period. They need um, a cold period for a certain amount of time to trigger in their response to go to seed, um, to kind of stop them from growing into nice, fat, hardy roots, and instead put that energy into to sending up a stock with flowers. Um, and those carrots, beets, chard, um, cabbage, those are... Um, those are examples of that. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being a little Iowa-centric here. When it's really cold, like it is right now, where it's below zero nearly, um, we can't leave those in the ground because the roots will turn to mush. Um, for those of you in the Pacific Northwest, you live um, in ideal biennial growing conditions and, and can leave your crops in, there, in the ground year-round. Um, there are probably some of you who live where it's really warm throughout the winter and maybe your concern is actually making sure your biennials vernalize, making sure that they do get enough of that, um, you know, below 40 degree or below 50 degree temperature to kick them into gear for seed saving. So biennials, if you want to work with biennials, it'll take a little bit more research, especially depending um, on where you live. If you live somewhere north and cold, um, you are going to have to uh, dig them up and put them in a root cellar and come back to that the following um, spring and plant them out. Here's an example of annuals and biennials. And I like this picture on the top right because you can see um, how s just how sad these biennials look when they come out of the root cellar from the winter. They just, they're dying for a little um, sunlight there. Um, and at this point, I'd like to take some questions. Um, I, before, uh, or while you're writing your questions, uh, the free online resource with a great chart is at this www.seedalliance.org. Um, it's called a Seed Saving Guide for Gardeners and Farmers. There's a chart in the back that has um, isolation distance and population sizes. And, um, and don't be alarmed by it either if it seems intimidating, um, you know, like if it suggests that you grow 60 brassicas really assess what your own needs as a gardener are. You know, if you're, if you're a beginner seed saver um, and you're saving seed just for year to year, 
maybe you can accept a little cross pollination in, in your seed and it's not going to bother you. Um, if you're maybe more intermediate level and you participate in seed swaps and you want to share your seed with people, um, maybe you should be a little more concerned with um, how healthy and robust your population is and, and ensure a little bit of um, purity in it. If you're selling your seed, you're really going to have to um, you know, stick to these uh, different kinds of guides and things like that. So really assess what your own needs are. Thanks so much for joining us and thanks for supporting Seed Savers. Night everybody.